Um, okay, so we're looking now at verse 3, Vayikir Mikra, is it related to um, to good fortune? Could be that there is some relation, because, you know, uh, we also say things, I was fortunate enough to, so it was usually like an, a, a coincidence, <clears throat> but the I think the Hebrew uh, the the Hebrew root of Yakar is Yud Kufresh, and the Hebrew of Mikre is Kufresh Hey, but they could have been they could be related. But um, I also wanted to add to that that and actually some somehow was uh, preserved in translation. It says her hap was, or her happenstance was. In Hebrews, Vayikir Mikreha. And that supports, the, I think, the argument of that it was deliberate. It was her happening that happened, meaning she made it happen and look like that. And, uh, okay, so we, we, were, we stopped here at verse uh, 12, where Boaz becomes God's representative, and he says, God will recompensate you for what you did, um, and you came to be under God's wing. She emphasizes it. Like Abby said before, she wanted she wanted to be, she wanted to find, find favor, and she says, oh, now I know that I have found favor. Uh, right? Let me find favor in your eyes, my Lord, uh, for you have comforted me, and you have spoken to the heart of your handmaid, though I not be as one of your handmaidens. So she says, I do not belong to the group, but you brought me in. Now, okay, so uh, let's continue in verse uh, verse 14. Um, we we'll read, uh, Brandon, you want to read that? Verse 14. Sure. <clears throat> and Boaz said unto her at mealtime, Come hither, and eat the bread and morsel and vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and they reached her parched corn, and she did eat and was satisfied, and left thereof. Okay. So, first of all, I have to uh, correct something here in the translation. Uh, it's not they reached her parched corn, but rather, in the Hebrew, he... He reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was satisfied, and left thereof. Okay. Left what? Left remnants of the food, meaning she didn't eat everything, right? Okay. What What do you see in this, what happens in this uh, pasuk, in this verse? Again, trying to visualize, to get as much, as much out of the biblical verse as possible. Well, it seems like the relationship is evolving, that she's becoming more and more intimate now that um, she's not just one of the maidens. Now she's at the table with him. Um, yes. Okay. And so he invites her to the table, which basically she's not entitled to because she's not one of the workers. Right. So he elevates her. Uh, she's like, like we said, she's under her wing. And he says, come, eat from the bread, eat from the bread, and eat of the bread, and dip your your bread in vinegar. Uh, but what happens after this invitation? She sat beside the reapers. I mean, this is not as clear in the English as in the Hebrew. Mitzad, meaning to the side not beside as, you know, with people, but rather uh, a little bit removed from them to the side of the reapers. And is she eating? No. She's not eating. Right. He has to reach for her parched corn, and then she eats. He... Yeah, she, he has to feed her. He has to feed her. So what what's going on here? Yeah, that, that's a bad... I think the reach... Uh, he reached her part... I think that's a... 
not a great English. <laughs> no, uh, let's let's. Um, so uh, but, I mean, he, really, he hand like he handed her, or he held out to her. Yeah, you know. litzvot litzvot is to hold with an um, with a. Uh, Okay, let's leave it like that. I'm not sure what would be the exact translation. It's like holding with the... Um, when you pick up barbecue and, you know, uh, something hot, you hold it with uh, with tongues, right? Right. So, so what do you call the act of picking up with tongues? What would it be? Like, uh, served, served her? Sir, yeah, okay. Served her. Yeah, he served her. Or so, passed to her? <laughs> no, he served her because uh, Kali, parched corn. By the way, it doesn't mean corn because it didn't have corn in Israel at the time. Uh, it means the, the stalks of wheat or barley that they used to roast in the fire. Um, the uh, Usually when they were still green, so it becomes like it's like popped corn or, or roast, uh, roast grain, and it's hot. So he has to take it by hand by but with something... Uh, tongues maybe and give it to her so uh, and this is this is, is even a higher level of intimacy the owner of the field Boaz himself feeds this lowly woman that up until now was just a, a handmaiden who is a, a poor woman who comes and, and picks up what the leftovers of the reapers and now she has so much food that she can eat and be satisfied and left some uh, and leave some behind, right? Um, and how does she achieve all that? How does she get to the point where he feeds her? By being passive. You see, that her wisdom is always up up to here. Pretending to be passive, to be humble, to be standing, not to collect too much, she gets more. And... Uh, you know, I don't know where this uh, this comes from, but that's that, that's what maybe a, a mentality that she developed um, by being passive. She prompts Boaz to serve her and to get to start building this relationship. So let's see what happens next. Uh, Josh, you want to read that uh, fifteen? And when she was risen up to glean. Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and put her not to shame. Let me continue. Yes. And also pull out some for her of purpose from the bundles, and leave it, and let her glean, and rebuke her not. Okay. Now what? Now what is happening? She's taking the art of being passive to a whole new level. Yeah. Right. So not only not only should you let her glean, you should set it up for her so that her gleaning will be very successful. Yes. Not only from the not only does she glean not only from the corners of the field, but she's gleaning from the bundles you've already made. Right. He says, go and undo what you did and just throw it on the ground so she can pick it up, but make it look casual so she will feel comfortable. Yeah. Because I already see that she's such a humble girl that she doesn't feel comfortable you know, pushing and shoving and, and taking stuff that doesn't belong to her. So she, she achieved that really amazing status by being very quiet, very, very uh, uh, sort of submissive. But you realize that the, this whole thing is vatakom. It all starts with she rose. Vatakom lelaket. She stands up. And, and I think that here it's... Uh, also symbolic, because if we see her movement since she came to the field, first she comes, right? And in verse in verse 3, she went and she came. Uh, in verse 7, she stood even. In verse 10, she fell on her face and bowed down. And now she starts rising by... Here, I didn't mark this one. Goshi Halom. Come hither. Come here. So she comes over. And she sat. And now she rises. 
So she comes, she stands, falls, comes again to Boaz, sits, and now she stands up. She she has a, a, a accomplished a whole cycle of of status of who she is. Then being a first, she stood in the field as someone who was unknown. Now she comes back to the field, she stands up as someone who owns the territory. She belongs there. And look here. Remember the first, uh, one of the first word of actions that we saw in chapter 1 was in verse 6. What, what does it say? Moab. Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the field of Moab. Now when she arises, she doesn't know where she's going, it's uncertainty, but she just wants to, to take herself out of the misery where she's at right now. So the, uh, the way the word is echoed in verse in chapter 2 is unlike the first time that we have a person rising, which is Naomi, in chapter 1, now we have Ruth rising in chapter 2, but she rises in a way that she really is in control of the situation. Also, I'll give you another, uh, uh, we have another word here that is uh, echoing a previous term. Look what it says here. Um, leave it. Right? Leave what? It refers to the to the wheat that you pull out of the bundles. Where have we seen this word before? Va'azavtem. The, the verb azav in Hebrew is to leave. Um, I think it's attributed to Ruth, right? She left. Yes. Think, so. She left what? I think she left. It wasn't it when she left. No, I'm not trying to remember now. But it was earlier. Left her people or her. her oh, yeah. Left her people. Oh, that's okay. Right. That's so here again, we see this interesting concept of the reward that is woven into the fabric of the story. You left your father and mother. Now we're going to leave for you. Uh, extra wheat, so you could you could uh, glean. You 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 clung to Naomi. Now you can cling with the girls. So um, now what happens next? Um, to uh, I'll read this. Uh, I'll read the Hebrew. So v'teleket basade ada arev v'tahbot et asher liket avayi kefas seorim. So she gleaned in the field until even. Wow, nice. Until the evening. <laughs> uh, uh, and she beat out that which she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. Now, ephah is about, like, uh, I think something like 40 pounds, if I'm not wrong. That's a... Let me... If I'm not wrong, this is the... Uh, I always forget the exact amount, but it's a lot. A fa. Uh, a fa is like yeah, it's, it's about it's about forty forty pounds. It's a big. Uh, let's see, come with that nefa. Anyway, uh, if uh, here, if uh, they don't have it, okay. Anyway, I know it. This is the uh, one second. Now I don't know where to close this one. Okay, you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So this yeah. is this, this yeah. is a, this is a huge amount of barley. Kefas Rawim. This is a huge amount of barley. And uh, and so you see, this there's a uh, like a divide, a line dividing Ruth before talking to Boaz and after talking to Boaz. Before talking to Boaz is zeshivta uh, habayit me'at from the morning till now, and then from now till the evening. For, so from the morning to, till now, she has very little to take back home, but from now till the evening 
it's about uh, an eifa of barley. So what does she do? And she took it up and went into the city. Vatisa. Vatisa. And I, Josh, you mentioned this word before when we were looking at the first chapter. You remember? That you said maybe this is a verb of uh, uh, of movement. Is Vayisuna im Nashim. The word nasa in Hebrew is to carry, is to lift. And mm-hmm. and it is used also in the sense of marriage to took because it's to take up. I guess it's the idea of taking up responsibility. Uh so the the sons of Naomi carried up or took wives from Moab. It didn't go well. What happened to them? They died. And then when uh they say goodbye to Naomi, they raise their voice. They raise their voice. They lifted up their voice again with the same term. Vatisena kolan, vatifkena. They carry up their voice and they cry. But now comes the reversal of that, where the word naso is used in the positive way, where she carries the she took up what she what she gleaned in the field, but also. She comes. How can we do? How can we not have our favorite word here? Vatavo. Oh my goodness. Okay, one second. Um, okay. So, Vatisa Vatavo Hayil. Vatere Hamota et Asher Liketa. And her mother in law saw what she has glean, had gleaned. When, when we say that she saw what she has gleaned, means that her eyes widened with surprise. She's shocked. This is not something uh, regular. And she brought forth and gave to her that which she had left after she was satisfied. This is such a minute detail. Such a minor detail. Why is it so important? To see here in verse 14, She left they're off. She leaves something here, right? And here she gave her that which was left after she was satisfied. Why is it important? What does it show us? So that's just funny because there's a lot of pronouns there. Um, so Ruth gave to Naomi. What, whatever was left after Naomi finished eating. So after Ruth, yeah. What is it? Right. What, what, so what like is it? Ruth saved some so that she had some right. to bring back to Naomi. Right. So let's get, let's get into the mind of the poor person, right? If Ruth did not, let's say Ruth did not have that left over, right? What would have happened then? She comes with the a, with a fa of barley, and what happens now? You're, you're, we we need to get in the mentality of a poor poor man's a poor woman's mm-hmm. house. The 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 stuff that she brought with her from from the meal was already made. Exactly. It was ready to eat. Right. So that's a that's a that's a great blessing, right? Usually, the people who work in the field all day come back home with grain. Now they have to process it and they have to make food. So they have to stay, you know, even uh, spend more time and energy uh, in order to, to take care of that. Let me show you um, where we have something similar to that. Um, I'm I'm going to share something else now. Uh, wait. That is, do you remember what happened with the story of the manna uh, when Bnei Israel, the Israelites received this uh, heavenly food? What did they have to do with it? Uh, they, they were not allowed to store any extra. Yeah, that that is true. They were not allowed to, to, to store anything. Um, one second. Except, except on Shabbos. Yeah, on Friday. Right. On Friday for Shabbat, right. 
A čo tu hodím? I mean, there seems to be an inclination toward not being a glutton. Yes. Um, where is it? I want to show you something. One second. Okay, two. Look here. This is in the, in the, the book of Amidbar, uh, chapter 11. No, sorry, it's, this is Exodus. I want to go to uh, Numbers, chapter 11, which also, by the way, chapter 11 in Numbers is where where the, uh, you know, uh, faith goes into chapter 11, this bankruptcy here. Um, it says here in verse 7, Now the manna was like coriander seed, and uh, the appearance thereof as the appearance of bedellium, the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills and beat it in mortars and seeded it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of a cake baked with oil. So it was not an easy process to get the, the you know, the manna and, and eat it. Um, I think that the manna was something like soybeans because it sounds like that you really have to, pro- something similar, uh, a grain with a lot of protein in it that... Uh, you could make it into, you could bake it, you could make oil from it, it's protein, uh, but you have to work hard to process it. So definitely people had to do it with grain. Uh, it just describes here how difficult um, this is. So when we go back to the text here, the fact that Ruth brings with her food, ready food, is a huge blessing. And it shows us that already here, when Vatochal Vatizba Vatotar, she did eat and was satisfied and left thereof, it's not a coincidence. She's already thinking about Naomi. She says, I'm going to go back home to my mother-in-law. I want to give her something ready to eat. So when she comes home uh, and she, she gives her and she eats, now her mother-in-law says unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where waters to thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. So we, we don't even go, go back past this point. Uh, this is not okay. This word is not fair. <laughs> uh, let's put it this way. Oh, this yeah, you neither, <laughs> right? <laughs> Enigmatic, yeah. Uh, where <clears throat> I would translate like that, right? I says, where, where have you gleaned? Where have you worked? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. He doesn't, she doesn't know anything about the man. How could she say that? What, but look what the, how she called, how she names a person. He who took knowledge of you. Or in Hebrew, makirech. Yehi makirech. The word that Ruth uses in verse 10 why did you take cognizance of me? I mean, why did you acknowledge me? Naomi, without knowing what happened in the field, realizes that something special happened because this is not the regular amount that one would bring as a gatherer, as a poor person that relies on charity. So she says, Whoever, whoever helped you is someone who gives you special attentions, and may he be blessed. And that, I think, this word, Baruch, blessed, is the first positive word that comes out of Naomi's lips. You realize that? All up until that point, she's extremely negative. Look at yeah. verse, uh, chapter right. 1. Don't call me Naomi. She's Mara. Call me Mara. The Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, the Lord brought me back home. She go uh, uh, further back. She, she says, uh, uh, you know, you did, you dealt kindly with the dead. And it's all like sarcastic. Uh, I have no children for you. I am too old. I will have no children. I am bitter. God is God has struck against me. Or she doesn't talk at all. But all of a sudden, Naomi now says, he who has... Uh, to acknowledge of you should be blessed. So that's that's an achievement. 
should, should, which should be attributed to to Ruth. She managed, uh, again, without speaking, she doesn't come and say, oh, mom, you have to know, I have to tell you what happened. No, she comes in, and she says, look what I, this is what I did today. Uh, again, I think playing it, uh, the, the simpleton, she pretends to not know that what she has with her is uncommon. She just comes in and she brings, like, this is what I did today, and I have also this food, and her, and her mother-in-law says, no, this is uncommon. This is out of the ordinary. Where, we, where did you go? What did you do? And it, the guy who, who, who took knowledge of you uh, should be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and she said, the man's name with whom I wrote today is Boaz. So you, you hear that kind of like innocence in her voice? Oh, just, you know, it, it so happens that the man that I work with today, his name is Boaz. Does it sound familiar? Do, do you know that man? And look, and, and uh, now let's see the response. Julian, you want to read the verse 20? Yes. Uh, and Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is nigh of kin unto us, one of our near kinsmen. Okay. So, what, what does Naomi tell uh, Ruth here? Let's yes. let's analyze her sentence. So first she says, Baruch Hu Adonai. She's giving thanks. Right, so the man is blessed yep. by God. What were the relationships of Naomi with God so far? Would say, at best, tense relationships, right? Not real happy. Not, not so happy. We have, again, the term Azav, Hashem did not leave his kindness to the living and to the dead. But where did we see before this idea of kindness with the living and the dead? In chapter 1, when she talks to her daughters-in-law, she says, May Hashem deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. But now she says it about herself. She says, I see that God does remember me and does deal kindly with me. What 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 Ruth wanted to do, I think more than anything, is not only to help Naomi physically. She could have gone and, and get her food and get her whatever she needed. She wanted her to change her mentality, and I believe also not just not really to change it, but rather to restore it. Uh, Naomi name Naomi's name, as we mentioned before, symbolically Naomi means pleasant. But she become she becomes Mara bitter, right? So Naomi had been in the past a pleasant woman. She probably was a great woman, a woman of valor, a woman who was was a leader. Um, and Ruth knew her at the time of her greatness, and she wants to bring her back. And the way to bring her back, and that I think you know. I mean, those of you who are uh, engaged in pastoral care or therapy or anything like that is uh, to not make the person feel that he or she are down and that they need help, but rather uh, by guiding them or goading them uh, gently towards finding uh, the way of rising up from where they are. So this is what Ruth does, very gently. She doesn't tell... Uh, she doesn't tell Naomi, you know, I went and I looked for the field of a relative and asked him for, for help. But rather she says, I don't know, I just happened to be in the field by the, that belongs to a name uh, by the, the guy by the name of Boaz. And Naomi gets, gets all excited. She says, oh, this is the hand of God. No, in reality, it's the hand of Ruth getting things done, manipulating everyone. But she makes... Naomi believes that God is doing that, and therefore she restores her faith. And once she restores her faith, now Naomi is willing to act.
And I think I think the text sets that up because, you know, at the beginning of chapter two, it stated that Naomi had the kinsman. <laughs> right. And right. so it's like that. Inf- it, so we know that that information is out there. Right. Right. That's why I said that this is the all knowing narrator. Right. The the omniscient narrator knows that this is the relative. But um, I think he sets us up on two levels. First of all, how he's going to uh, uh, act later on with uh, Naomi, but also how to understand Ruth's actions. Because we could have understood that as it's a pure pure coincidence or meaning or, or God's hand that took her to Boaz's field, or Ruth already is aware of that relative and she wants to do it, but in a way that will allow, uh, will allow Naomi to join in. And uh, because here we could ask the, ask the question, if Naomi had this relative, Boaz, why didn't she approach him before that for food, for help? Because she didn't. Why is it? Well, I think uh, I think Naomi believed strongly in the the hand of God. So that's just she gave up. She's despair. She's desperate because God uh, smote her. So there's no point to try to do anything. That that is a, that is definitely a possibility. That is, she just gave up. Well, she mean, doesn't want to ask for favors. Or you know, it's difficult. I was going to say it's difficult in any um, family to approach a distant relative. We don't exactly know the relationship between Elimelech and and Boaz, um, but certainly it's a little bit intimidating for anybody to go ask for help, having not had any connection for a number of years. Right. You know, they they left. Um, okay, so, so we have we have religious despair. Or sort of what Abby says, like acceptance of the divine verdict. God wants me to be empty. So in in that sense, I would say she she shuts herself in the house almost as in a grave. She, but but also not not just that, but also maybe sort of the you know her 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 theology um, that you know if some you know I don't think something maybe good could come along, but that would be, like, through God's hand. Oh, uh, okay. So, so, like, if she if she knew that Ruth was, you know, going out and, you know, making actions happen on her own, you know, of, of that will... That's she would be happy. From, it's different from just feeling like this was, what a chance encounter, God's hand is, God is favoring me again. Yes. Right, that's also a possibility. So... <laughs> So either she does that just because she she believes in being passive and waiting for God's hand, uh, or she she really gave up on life and she might just stay there and die and hung you know of hunger, or like Josh said, she doesn't doesn't feel comfortable uh, approaching someone after they were disconnected for so long, and I think also there's a the element of uh, maybe it's connected of pride of being too proud to ask for help. So Ruth does it in a way that will not hurt Naomi's pride. And when Naomi feels, like Abby said, that this is the divine divine hand guiding events, um, and that God did not abandon me, but it's a reversal of faith of Naomi. She says, I thought that God abandoned me. I thought that God cast me away, that he's out there to strike me. But I see that he is with me, still loves me, in a way. And here, Naomi comes with this uh, revelation. The man is nigh of kin unto us, one of our near kinsmen. And Ruth must have fallen off her feet. Wow, I didn't know. What a surprise, right? Uh, and then, I mean, this takes from Ruth uh, that kind of... Uh, really resolution to say, okay, I'm not going to say anything. You know, I I know exactly who the man is. I uh, conducted everything. So, and you see that Ruth is uh, very well aware of the situation in the way she manipulates everything because she waits for only for that moment now that Naomi 
comes with this extremely positive statement, and she says, he is our relative, God loves me, God is with me, now, now, she gives her that piece of information. Gam ki amar elai, yeah, he said unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Cling with my the bo- with the boys until uh, they finish the harvest. And Naomi answers, Tov It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maidens and that you be not met in any other field. Now, riddle or a question here um he did say that right in verse uh eight right but between verse eight and 21 and 22 there's something going on something is something is amiss what's happening here maybe i'll bring i'll bring verse 21 uh, verse 8 closer so we could see it. Let me put it here. Uh, now compare those three three verses. 8, 21, and 22. What do you see here? Some in, in congruency. Uh, well, first of all, um, Boaz says to Ruth, cling here to my maidens, and Ruth reports it as basically cling to my young men. And? Um, and go on. Um, and verse 22. And Naomi. Yeah, yes, and Julie. Naomi references maidens. <laughs> ha, what's happening? Is, Even right? Ruth, I mean, Ruth says men, and Naomi says women. Yeah, why? Why is it? What is it deliberate? I think it is. I think they they hear what they want to hear. Oh, okay. So this just okay. Yeah. We attribute it. It's just you know, uh, she wants to be with the boys, right? But I mean, that could be if we only would only look at this pasuk in an you know an isolated verse. Yes, right. but given uh, Ruth' uh, sharp focus on her goal. And the way that she releases information, you see that she's very measured. She she could have come in, burst into the house, and tell her mother-in-law, wow, look what I did today, da, 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 and tell her the whole thing, right? But instead, she's like, look what I brought. And then her mother-in-law eats, and she's surprised. Like, Where did you get it from? Oh, that man Boaz. Wow, it's amazing. God blesses us. He's a relative. And Ruth says, oh, yeah, he also told me that, right? She's She's... Uh, you know that her press release is very measured, like very, very organized. So maybe what happens is this: uh, Boaz says, "Cling with my maidens," specifically because he already, like you mentioned before, he has his eye on her as a redeemer, as a protector, whatever it is. Ruth wants Naomi to feel that she is the. She is the matchmaker. She is going to pull the strings, right? So she says, oh yeah, he said I should cling to his young men, to work with the men. Meaning, uh, there's no way that I'm going to marry him. I'm going to hang out with the boys, with the fields. I'm I'm of a lower class, so I'm probably going to end up marrying one of the workers in the field. Naomi says... No, no, no. It is good that you go out with his maidens. Don't go with the boys. Even though Naomi Naomi is not a prophetess. She doesn't know that Boaz said go with the girls. But she tells Ruth, no, it's not good for you to be with the boys. Go with his girls. Right. I think it's very interesting. Go, Ruth? Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Julian. No, go ahead, Julian. I think it's very interesting that Boaz and Ruth take really the same approach in the same tone, both protective as well as using a specific um, way to address her, my, my daughter. Right, right. Boaz and Naomi, right, both of them. Interesting. Like, above her head, they, they, they form this relationship. Yes, and, and Josh? Yeah, I was going to say, Ruth is taking a very uh, common tack to make everything seem like it's Naomi's idea. Exactly. This is the so whole... It, yeah. it, re, it rebuilds her confidence. 
Yes. And her ability to start to control things and manage life. Yes, and and I'm presenting to you this chapter, this like the, when we do direct Tanakh, because I've I've read this since I was a kid, and I saw the you know movies on that and 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 uh, you know animated films and everything, and uh, only when I started reaching and analyzing the verbs and the words, I realized how uh, structured this is, and how calculated Ruth is in her efforts to make everything seem casual. Uh, so, and now it also it also explains the 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 end of Ruth of Naomi's statement. You will not be met in any other field. Now, the word paga in modern Hebrew, the term the the verb paga is to to hurt or to attack. Um, in biblical Hebrew, paga means either to ask. Uh, to 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 request something, or to meet, uh, uh, you know, casually or you know, not not deliberately. So she says, "No, you should stay with the girls. This way, you remain available." So that is uh, and that is exactly what she did. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. But look what, at the end of this chapter, she is passive. Just like before, you know, she she's either sitting in the house or bringing back little to the house. She dwelt with her mother-in-law. Meaning that for her, okay, I did my part. I did what I have to do. That's it. Right? I don't know where to continue from here. And you know what happens in the next chapter. Before you move on, can you go back? I wanted to look at those three verses yes. again. Yes, so one second. Uh, here, eight, yes. 8, 20. And, yeah, yeah that's you. 8. I have just to clarify that. Yeah. Because also, Boaz tells Ruth not to pass from hence. Yes. Um, but yet, she does. She goes back to... Naomi. No, he means don't go when you glean. Don't go to another. Don't go to another field. Not not to, to sleep there. Yeah. He means this. This is this is your this is your place. Yeah. Which is interesting in the sense of like we said before, she was looking for a place. She was looking for a place to call home, and now she finds it. Um. So did you see Julian? The I did. Thank you. Okay. Um. When when we go here, uh. Oh, to this, to this, um, to the third chapter. Do you remember what happens in the beginning of the third chapter? In the in the beginning of the third chapter, Naomi tells Ruth to to dress up, I mean, to dress in fancy clothes, and uh, and 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 get uh, you know put uh, ointments and uh, and all that, and go to the threshing hold and sleep next to the, uh, next to Boaz. Or, in other words, make an advance in the very, very uh, uh, blatant way. What was Ruth doing until then? And this is, this is you know, in, in continuation of her uh, attitude, she doesn't show any interest in Boaz or anyone else. She finishes, she she, she tells uh, Naomi, or she doesn't say it, but she shows her attitude that whatever she did was just a, a, a pragmatic relationship. She just needed to bring food home. She had a protector who gave her food. That's it. Now it's over. It's over. Naomi says, no, now let's move it to the next phase. But who's... Who's the uh, the one who has the initiative? Who's the one who's pushing all that? It's Naomi. So um, that that I think you know we could we could talk a little bit about more uh, next week, God willing, about and see how how the book ends um, and where Ruth leads this whole uh, this whole uh, uh, process. But uh, all in all, I think we've seen through the uh, the highlighting of the verbs. Uh, Azav, Ba, 
to leave, to come, to stay, to stand. An amazing uh, undercurrent under this, uh, under this, you know, seemingly maybe simple story.